You've tried content marketing. You've seen some success. Your boss or your client wants to see more. You might be wondering, where do I go from here? Well, you've come to the right place. This course gives you the advanced knowledge and practical skills you need to take your content marketing program from good to great. You'll learn how to scale your content marketing with message architecture, compelling stories, unique thought leadership, and advanced content operations. Throughout the course, you'll get well-researched facts, proven techniques, and real-world examples based on my 20 years of content experience. And you already know the basics, so this course focuses only on advanced material. I'm Colleen Jones, author of The Content Advantage, founder of Content Science, and former head of content at MailChimp. And I love sharing what I've learned about content marketing. So if you're ready to take a journey that goes far beyond the basics, I'm ready to be your guide. Let's start advanced content marketing now. What do you want your customers to remember after they interact with your content? If you're not sure, chances are you need a message architecture. It ensures your customers get the right message, and it helps you and your team create interesting content that brings a message to life. A message architecture starts with creating a message, no surprise there. So let's walk through how to do exactly that. First, define what you want to communicate to your customers. To me, this is really focusing on what will benefit your brand or your company. A good starting point is to review your company's brand, voice, design, or identity guide. This usually lists characteristics that your company wants to exhibit. For example, when Intuit revamped TurboTax, they chose characteristics such as approachable and insightful. If your company doesn't have such a guide, that's okay. You can take a crack at writing down a few words or phrases and ask your marketing colleagues for feedback. And if you work in a large company, you can make this a group exercise. Check out the attached template. Now, let's consider your customers. Define what your customers want or need to hear. This is where you really put yourself in your customers' shoes. I suggest reviewing any customer journeys, insights, or personas on hand. If nothing like that is available, then check whether any publicly available research or information about your customers or your industry is available. Anything that helps you gain empathy for your customers is great. Then write down your customers' top aspirations, problems to solve, or frequent questions. Strive for five to 10. Again, if you work in a large company, you can make this a group brainstorming exercise. Check out the attached template. Finally, frame what you want to communicate in terms of what your customers want or need to hear. This is where message magic happens. Let's say it's important to your brand to come across as insightful. And let's say your customers are small business owners who don't have a lot of time. A key message for your content marketing might be insights in a jiffy. Once you define the message, you can bring it to life through show and tell. Take the message insights in a jiffy. You can show it through stories of other customers getting insights quickly, experts giving tips to get insights effectively, and more. You can also just say it occasionally. This combination of show and tell, to me, is what makes content marketing so powerful. So make your content marketing clear and compelling one message at a time. Your content marketing team will love bringing messages to life in creative ways, and your customers will find that content hard to resist. If you're like most content marketers, you have more than one message to convey. Fantastic. But you're also at risk for what I call message mayhem. That's when you have so much you're trying to communicate, you confuse your content marketing team and your customers. To avoid this risk and worse, organize your messages into a message architecture. So let's walk through how to turn a bunch of messages into a useful architecture. I've used this approach successfully with organizations ranging from small nonprofits to huge conglomerates. And you can do this yourself or get a few colleagues together to do it with you. First, write each message you want to convey on an index card or a post-it note. Strive for at least six messages and no more than 20. Then group the messages together into themes or categories. 
I find it's helpful to take a few passes at this. In your first pass, just go with your instincts. Don't think too hard about it. In your second pass, take a look at how big or small the groups are. If the group is big compared to the others, think about breaking it down into more than one group. If the group is small, think about combining it with another group. If you're doing this activity with colleagues, I suggest you each do the grouping individually and then compare results. Talk through where the similarities and differences are and then reach a consensus. Finally, decide on an overarching message for each theme or category. You might find one of the messages in the group works well as the overarching message, or you might need to write a new message. And if you're doing this with colleagues, consider drafting the overarching messages individually. Then share the drafts and vote on which message best conveys the theme or category. Then review your new message architecture. Ask yourself or the group, do these groups make sense? Do these overarching messages reflect our brand, our priorities, and our customer needs? Make any tweaks to the architecture and don't forget to keep your hard work. Take a picture of the final result and write the details in a spreadsheet or a document. A quick tip if you work for a very large or global company. You might need more than one message architecture to meet the needs of very different markets or geographic regions, and that's okay. For example, I helped the medical technology company Cerner Corporation develop messages for regions ranging from Europe to the Middle East. So don't create amazing messages only to fall victim to message mayhem. Avoid confusing your team and your customers. Bring order with a message architecture and you'll bring more success to your content marketing. So you have a message architecture. You think it's great, but what do your customers think? Message testing helps you find out. So let's walk through message testing so you can be confident your messages will resonate with your customers. Let's focus on qualitative testing, which is interviewing a small number of customers about the messages. First, recruit at least five customers to participate. Be sure to pick customers who represent the customer segment you're trying to reach. If you want the messages to resonate with more than one segment, then aim for three to five customers from each segment. You can invite customers to participate by email, in your store or office, at a trade show or event, or really anywhere you interact with customers. Consider offering a reward for participating, such as a gift card or free product or discount. So after recruiting is underway, plan the test logistics. This starts with drafting a testing protocol. Write down questions you want to ask customers. Also write down tips for yourself or whoever will conduct the interview. For example, you might want to include possible follow-up questions. And to help, I've provided a list of questions in the exercise files for this course to get you started. The next step is to decide where you will conduct the test. A conference room can work well, but if your company already has a market research or user experience lab, try to reserve it. And if you have to, you can conduct the test remotely with video conferencing like Skype or Zoom. To wrap up the planning, schedule the testing sessions. I recommend scheduling no more than three in one day. And also schedule a dry run session where you go through the session with a friend or coworker who acts like the customer. Finally, conduct the message testing and review the feedback. Start with the dry run and make any tweaks to the testing protocol. For example, you might want to change the wording of a question to make sure it's clear. Consider having a coworker help you conduct the tests. One of you can ask the questions and the other can take notes and help record the sessions. I recommend recording at least the audio. And after each session, don't forget to give each customer their reward. When you have feedback from five customers in the same segment, review it for common themes. Then consider whether to adjust your message architecture. For example, I once conducted such testing where customers commented the messages sounded cold. So we adjusted the tone. The changes you might have to make might be different, but there will be changes. Every time I've done testing like this, it has resulted in at least one change that improves the message architecture. Also consider creating a brief report of your testing to share with your team, stakeholders, and manager. 
it will go a long way towards strengthening their confidence in your content marketing program. So don't guess whether customers will love your message architecture. Ask them. Message testing will yield feedback that will help you refine messages until they resonate. Those messages will take your content marketing from meh to magnificent. Let's say you have a message architecture that you and your coworkers like, but you want to be absolutely sure your customers like it too. You might wonder, is there a way we can test our messages with lots of customers? Well, wonder no more. The answer is quantitative message testing. So let's walk through how you can use quantitative message testing. As you might guess from the name, the whole point of this testing is to get your messages in front of a large quantity of customers and to do it quickly. So first, let's talk about tools to do this testing. You will need a survey or remote testing tool. Your company might already have one, such as Qualtrics. If not, many free and affordable options are available. Two I like are SurveyMonkey and User Testing. Next, you will need to find people to participate in your testing. The most cost-effective way to do this is to invite your customers. You can do that by email or by inviting them when they visit your website, or you can do a combination. Your survey or remote testing tool can help you set up the details. It's faster and easier than ever before. I like to aim for at least 100 people who represent the type of customer you want to reach. If you don't have an email list and don't have much traffic coming to your website, then you will need to consider recruiting specific people to participate. This approach is significantly more expensive, but it gives you a high degree of control over who participates, so it can be worth the insight you gain. SurveyMonkey and user testing both offer recruiting services. Your company also might have a relationship with a market research firm that can help you recruit. Finally, you will need to set up the testing and use the results. I like setting up the test as a series of choices. Create a series of questions that ask customers to choose which company or product they prefer based on the messages. Make the answers variations of your message architecture. Include your preference along with variations that you considered along the way. Pull those rough drafts out of the trash, so to speak, and use them to help fill out your testing answer options. If you have so many messages you can't test them all, Focus on the ones you or your coworkers debated the most. To help jumpstart your setup, check out the worksheet attached. It also includes an example. Now, as with any testing, it's important you understand how to make use of the results. So you should learn from this testing two things. One is what messages are validated clearly. When customers overwhelmingly prefer the messages you included in your message architecture, you can launch them with confidence. The second is, what messages are invalidated clearly? In other words, you will see whether a message bombs. And if you plan to use that message, you will need to go back to the drawing board. You can consider what other message options customers preferred as you revise the message. So don't launch your new message architecture on a wing and a prayer. Use quantitative message testing to get feedback from lots of customers and make any final tweaks to your messages. Then you will launch a message architecture that your customers will love. Think about one of your favorite stories. Why do you love it? I bet one of the reasons is the story flows. When you read or watch the story, you believe it on some level. It makes sense to you. The great news is you can make your content marketing flow like one of your favorite stories. But there's a catch. It's not easy. That's where storylines can help. So I'm going to cover what a storyline is and how you can architect storylines to make your content marketing more organized and compelling. A storyline is essentially the plot or what happens from the beginning to the middle to the end. I think of it as the Twitter version of a story. One way to jumpstart your storyline is to use a pattern. Sometimes it's called a narrative pattern. 
I'd like to highlight two patterns I've found helpful for content marketing. The first pattern is simply chronological order. This is telling the story in the order events happened. One example is telling the history of your company or brand. Another example is creating a countdown to a big event or launch. And still another is coming of age, where your company or an employee adapts by learning an important lesson. As most companies today have to adapt faster to digital disruption, the coming of age pattern will be incredibly handy to you. The second pattern I often use is problem solution or before after. This is when you show the problem, the solution, and how the solution made an impact. You can use this pattern in many different forms. It works well in a serious case study, but it also can take more lighthearted forms. One of my favorite funny examples is a video Cisco released a few years ago on Valentine's Day. The problem was finding a last minute gift to express your love. The solution was, wait for it, Cisco's ASR 9000. Yes, offering a $250,000 network router as a solution to Valentine's Day is ridiculous. So ridiculous that this video went viral and gave millions of people a few moments of delight. Whether or not you buy network routers, you left the video with positive feelings about Cisco. The marketing great Roy H. Williams once said, a good story increases the saleability of an item without increasing its actual value. You can tell a good story by architecting storylines like coming of age or problem solution. You will make your content marketing more compelling and don't be surprised if your sales skyrocket too. My favorite superhero right now is Captain Marvel. Did you ever have a favorite superhero? Chances are you did because superheroes pervade everything from classic literature to box office smashes. Many people love stories with a superhero. So what does this have to do with content marketing? Well, you can use superheroes in your stories. And one of the best ways to do so is simply this, make your customer the hero. Now, I don't mean give your customers a cape. Let's walk through two techniques to position your customers as heroes. One technique is what I call save the day. This is when you explain how your customer rescued their company or their own customers from a threat. For instance, FreshBooks offers videos of many small business customers who saved their companies from struggle or even failure by making their accounting tasks more organized and efficient. A second technique is what I call make the world better. This is when you explain how your customer is making a difference in business, society, or the environment. For example, Airbnb Magazine sends travel reporters to interesting Airbnb homes. Recently, the magazine told the story of a huge home outside Mexico City shaped like a snake. That alone is delightful, but the reporter also uncovered deeper stories. These stories position the home architect as a champion of organic architecture and Mexican culture. Your customer might champion something different, but I guarantee you they are trying to make the world better. Find out how and tell that story. Now, the key to both techniques is emphasis. What I mean by that is these stories are not about your company. They're about your customers. Your company or your products and services might play a role in each story, but the customer is the hero. Going back to the Airbnb example, the snake house story mentions its availability on Airbnb very subtly. This focuses on the amazing house and the architect behind it. Captain Marvel once said, the universe is so big, it has no center. We are the center. Make your customers the center of your content marketing universe. Share how they saved the day or made the world a better place. Your customers will love you for making them heroes, and they will inspire others to become your new customers. Employees are a company's greatest asset. That's a quote by former Xerox CEO, Anne Mulcahy. And that's absolutely true for your content marketing. You see, employees make compelling heroes in your stories. 
So let's walk through two techniques for incorporating employees in your content marketing stories. One technique is what I call save the day. This is when you explain how your employees rescued the company or your customers from a threat. Tennessee Valley Authority, or TVA for short, does an excellent job with this. TVA regularly shares stories about how its employees have responded to environmental problems like flooding and pollution, as well as energy problems like power outages and shortages. Another example is General Electric, who shares stories about employees overcoming complex technical or engineering challenges. One recent example is a video about a new type of 3D printing for manufacturing aerospace parts. This isn't a shiny, happy video. The video explains his frustrations and failures on the way to success. And who can't relate to that struggle? A second technique is what I call make the world better. This is when you explain how your employees are making a positive difference in the world. For example, the Home Depot regularly features employees who are veterans, who lead responsible sourcing, who serve their communities, and who are pursuing inspiring goals like Olympic competition. And I'm just scratching the surface. Now, your employees might care about completely different things, but I have no doubt they're trying to make the world better. Unlock those stories in your content marketing. The key to both techniques is connecting your employee stories to your company values. Include subtle reminders or mentions of your company values within the story. For example, when the Home Depot tells a story related to a veteran, they subtly mention their commitment to serve veterans by hiring military, donating to nonprofits that aid veterans, and more. Your values might be different, but connecting them to your employee stories will be just as compelling. So content marketing is one more way employees are a great asset to your company. Make employees the heroes by showing how they save the day or make the world a better place. Your employees will welcome the appreciation and your customers will see your company values come to life. A story is an argument, and an argument is a story. That's a brilliant statement by Robert Rose of Content Marketing Institute. What arguments and stories have in common is persuasion. If you ever lost interest in a story because you didn't buy it or you didn't find it compelling, you know exactly what I'm talking about. So let's review two key persuasive techniques to make your stories more compelling. The first technique is identification. It comes out of persuasion psychology, and it's the phenomenon of a person relating to another person. Now, you might wonder, what does this mean for my content marketing stories? It means you need to include at least one character that your customers can identify with. Now, identification can be shallow, such as if you have blonde hair, you might identify with me because I have blonde hair. Identification also can be deep such as identifying with someone's situation or values. For instance, I have no idea what it's like to fly in space with supernatural power, but I relate to the condescension Captain Marvel experienced in her quest to reach her full potential. One of my favorite examples of identification and content marketing is REI, a sporting goods retailer. True to its brand, REI creates a steady stream of content around environmental concerns from articles to videos and podcasts. REI even turned Black Friday into a cause in its own right with the Opt Outside campaign, making it a day that's as much about being thankful for the outdoors as it is about shopping. So let's move on to a second technique, the persuasive appeals. Everyone from the ancient Greeks to researcher Robert Cialdani have studied persuasion. They all agree you have to appeal to both logic and emotion. Logic is essentially reasoning. When you make a claim, you need to be able to back it up. You can support claims with evidence such as facts and testimonials. As a simple example, REI claims it is the first U.S.-based travel company to become 100% carbon neutral. The evidence is that REI buys credits to support renewable energy like solar and wind. These credits compensate for REI's carbon emissions. Emotion 
is more straightforward to understand, but harder to actually execute. It involves tapping into people's emotions to hold their interest, gain their sympathies, or motivate them to act. Choose your words and visuals strategically to convey certain moods. Techniques such as hyperbole, personification, similes, and metaphors help to create the personality or feel of your content. Two very different examples are Bliss and HowStuffWorks.com. Bliss is sassy, whereas HowStuffWorks is analytical. So when it comes to content marketing, a story isn't just a story. It's also an opportunity to persuade your customers. With the techniques of identification, logic, and emotion, you can punch up your persuasive power. When you think of a story, what comes to mind? Perhaps a movie or a novel or a long news article? Well, that's certainly correct, but stories can come in many other forms too. When you create a mix of story forms, you can better reach the right customers with the right information. So I'm going to walk through a few different story forms and how you can use them in your content marketing. First, let's talk about short story forms. I think of these as story bites. Sometimes a taste is all you need or all you have time for. A few examples are quotes, infographics, and teasers. Humans of New York started as a photo blog of street portraits accompanied by direct quotes. And it's now world famous for its simple story and image format. Okay, let's move on to some interesting long story forms. I like to think of these as story snacks or meals where you need more substance. Longer stories can take shape in ebooks, white papers, long articles, videos that are more than a minute long, and interactive infographics or data visualizations. The New York Times does a great job with dynamic visualizations, such as interactive maps and graphs that cover topics ranging from typical Uber wait times to political and economic data, and even Game of Thrones characters. As another example, Hootsuite produces an annual report on digital trends that's read by millions of people globally and often cited by mainstream publications. Now, here's the fun part. Let's review clever ways to use short and long story forms together. You can create a long form story and then turn chunks of it into short form stories. Or you can do the opposite. You can create a series of short form stories and then eventually combine them into one long form story. For example, you could combine a series of interviews into a longer narrative, as Pew Research recently did after collecting 100 quotes from Americans about the meaning of life. Or you could pull out interesting individual facts from an infographic and create a little standalone snippets to share through your social media channels. So a story doesn't always have to be long to be effective. Mix up your story forms to make the most of your content marketing. Imagine this, your customers view your company as a trusted advisor. They turn to you for advice, guidance, and even inspiration. And they do so often. Sounds pretty great, right? But how the heck can you as a content marketer get your customers to view your company as a trusted advisor? The answer is thought leadership. So let's review what thought leadership is and how you can start to use it in your content marketing. Thought leadership is content that offers useful expertise, insight, or even training about topics your customers care about. I find that highly effective thought leadership also is unique. It's not like anything your competitors or the media offer. For example, Mouth offers amazing thought leadership about what we eat and drink. Mouth's network of independent food artisans offer unique perspectives and in-depth knowledge that you won't find, say, on Food Network. So to start creating thought leadership content, you need to figure out what topics to cover. You want to find the sweet spot between topics your customers care about and topics your company has expertise, data, or insight to advise. For instance, Vend provides point-of-sale software to retailers. The resources on its site touch on all things retail, from store layout to inventory management and e-commerce. 
as well as broader sales, marketing, and customer experience tips that its customers can benefit from. As another example, my fitness pal helps users on their wellness journey with healthy recipes, exercise tips, and nutritional insights. These are all natural topics that align with its brand mission. Here's a topic planning tip. Sometimes you have to frame the topic you can advise on in terms of the topic that interests your customers. In other words, frame the new knowledge you have to offer customers in terms of what they already know. Meet them where they are. For example, HubSpot caters to readers seeking step-by-step -step guides on specific topics, such as how to post gifts on Instagram or how to rank highly on Google, complete with included templates. They lay out a plan that's easy to follow for even the greenest of digital marketers. Ancestry.com CEO Margot Georgiadis once said that a trusted advisor encourages you to look at a problem or opportunity from multiple angles. That's exactly what you can do for your customers with thought leadership. Frame your expertise, advice, and guidance in terms of topics your customers care about. And don't be surprised if your customers keep coming back for more. What's the number one reason customers view content as not useful? My research shows it's the content seems too basic. Customers feel it doesn't have the right details or enough substance. What this means for you is if you don't offer the right depth in your thought leadership content, customers will not find it useful. So I'm going to share three approaches to cover your thought leadership topics well. You can use one approach or a mix of these approaches. First, let's talk about the newsroom approach. This is when you provide timely updates and commentary on events, changes, or trends related to your topics. For example, when the EU started to enforce the privacy regulation GDPR, MailChimp provided useful content explaining how to make email comply. The key to the newsroom approach is timely. Quickly put something useful out there and you can always follow up with more. So a second approach to cover thought leadership is the science lab approach. This is when you share insights about your topics based on your data, experiments, or other research. For instance, every year, Content Science assembles 50 critical content facts based on our research, as well as research by others. As another example, Intercom occasionally shares fascinating and useful research, such as the history of messaging. What I like about the Science Lab approach is the great mileage. You can mine insights and develop lots of unique content from a few sets of data or experiments. And you can even use the insights in the third approach to covering thought leadership. So let's talk about this approach. It's what I call the academy. This is providing training in some fashion about the topics you cover. For instance, the social media management tool Hootsuite offers excellent courses about social media marketing topics. And another example is Schneider Electric's Energy University, which is targeted at professionals working in energy efficiency or data centers. What I like about the academy approach is you can potentially monetize it. You can license the content to online training platforms, or you can charge customers a fee or a combination. So when you take on thought leadership, don't leave your customers in the shallow end of the pool. Take your customers on a deep dive into topics they care about. Your customers will not only view your content as useful, but they will trust your company more. As Stephen Covey once said, when the trust account is high, communication is easy, instant, and effective. The trust that your content builds will take your customer relationships to a whole new level.